studying one of the greatest masterpieces of all time called the Book of Romans. I, I presume it could have been, had, a, had a better book, but it, a better name, but it was written to a very specific uh, group originally. It, it was written to the church that was in Rome, made up of Jews and Gentiles. Uh, it, it could have been called the Book of Redemption, uh, the Book of Total Knowledge regarding salvation or something of that nature because it is a, it is a rare piece of literature. In working with this book, you'll see that Paul struggled uh, from chapter 1 through chapter 7 uh, with his old nature that he had battled as a rabbi and as a, as a high churchman in, in, in his religion. He had battled with it, that when he wanted to do right, evil was always there, and he had a, a big problem. But he, he broke through the clouds in, in chapter 8. And he came uh, into a, a new life and a new light. And so if you would open to page 72, uh, the lesson is entitled Victory Through the Holy Spirit. <coughs> if you permit me to say so, I think that might be the greatest need in this country right now is, is information and, uh, and, and instruction and who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit is, what he can do in your life. I think there are many so-called Christians that have little concept of the Holy Ghost himself, and they want to relegate him to an it, or they want to relegate him to an impersonal influence, but we want you to know that Jesus Christ said, I will send you an other comforter, and when he is come, when he is come. And, and so we are dealing with the third person of the Blessed Trinity. The, the Holy Spirit. In the book of Romans, uh, uh, chapter 8, Paul proclaims that the Christian can have their victory through and in the glorious force and power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't think we can learn enough. I don't think we can overdo it. I think we should penetrate it. Uh, and uh, great, great men of God spent their lives penetrating it. And so you and I should do likewise. In this book and this chapter, Romans 8, verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. The word Spirit there is with a capital S, uh, teaching us that there is a person involved, not an influence, but a person is involved. Uh, that as many as are led by the Spirit of God. I don't think you can be led by an influence. You can only be led by a person with intelligence. And so, if you're led by the Spirit of God, those people are the sons of God. That is a very simple statement. It is a pot potent sta a statement that there's only one qualification. If you're led by the Holy Spirit, you're a son of God. And those that are not led by the Holy Spirit, they're not children of God. And so the Holy Spirit has a lot to do with your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. He is also part of your spiritual being, your salvation, and every other part of you. I wish to give you 12 things the Holy Spirit does. It's very likely that this will be part one of this, of this uh, lesson, Victory Through the Holy Spirit. Number one, it says, he sets us free from sin. Now, now th th this is a statement that could take a lot of uh, amplification. <clears throat> Romans 8 and 2 says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. We have, uh, we have spoken on this at times, and possibly we should you know, speak on it even, even more. If you put a little circle around the word law, there is a law relating to the spirit of life. And notice again, it's with a capital S, speaking to the person of the Holy Ghost. There is a law. Now, uh, some people think it's an emotion. Some people think if you feel like it, you move in the spirit. If you don't feel like it, you don't move in the spirit. This has nothing to do with that at all. You are in Christ by a law. 
you are in Christ through the law of the spirit of the spirit of life. Isn't that amazing? There is a spirit. Uh, his name is the Holy Ghost, and he is the conductor of life. And so when you become a part of him and you begin uh, to follow him, you have entered into a system uh, of, uh, of, of things that, that are set down. Laws are always written, written laws. And, and you're, you've entered into something that you can know about for sure. It's not guesswork. It is, a, it is a knowledge that is for sure that you can enter into a law related to him who is, the, who is life, the spirit of life. Now, it, it's very careful to say this spirit of life is in Christ Jesus. One of the last things the Lord spoke on this earth was he says, now I'm going away. I will send you another comforter. I will send you another comforter. So whatever he does, he does it in Christ Jesus. He never does anything on his completely own. He receives his information from Jesus Christ and God the Father, and he communicates this to you and to me. So when you know this, you, you know that you're working in a law of life in Christ Jesus, not outside him, not other than him, but this is part of the very essence of Calvary. The Holy Spirit will lead you to Calvary. He will teach you what it means to be saved, and he will quicken something within you for acceptance of the truth of salvation, and he becomes part of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus, this law of life has made me free. Say free. free. It has made you to become a free person, it has made you to become a person not in shackles. It, it, it just makes me so angry, you know, at alcohol. Alcohol is the nearest nothing that ever came out of hell. Alcohol is artificially made. It doesn't grow like flowers. Man has to make that poison in order for it to be poison. And so he, he makes that poison and it ought to be in his radiator and he puts it in his body. And, and when he does, he's not a man anymore. He becomes a beast. He becomes a nut. He becomes altogether something else. Alcohol has never done a human in history any good. It has caused millions of people to go to hell. It's caused millions of murders. It's caused millions of broken homes. And anybody that has a good word for alcohol, brother, you need your screws tightened up. There is no good in a thing. The Bible says specifically that, that, that clean water and fresh water and salt water cannot come out of the same hole. And don't you start saying good things are in there because the Bible's already locked you out by, in telling you that you cannot have bad and good in the same thing. It's either good or it's bad. And alcohol is bad. You read about it in your papers and, and you read about the terrible situations that have happened where, where uh, because of alcohol, dumping, dumping uh, oil into the oceans and, and doing all th kind of things that contaminates nature, uh, the, 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 the wildlife and, and, and human life. It hurts everything. Can you say amen? amen? We ought to keep every living American out of taverns. If we have to with our foot in his back end. I know you don't like it. You just got it free, you see. Some of you, your refrigerators is full of the stuff and you'll go to hell with it too, I'm sure. It, it says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. As I was going to tell you, that the great thing that I have against alcohol uh, is that you become a prisoner of it. One man told me, he says, I can stop drinking anytime I want to. I ought to know, I've already, I've already stopped nine times. He doesn't even know when he's a slave and when he's not a slave. He's never stopped. He just jumped a ditch was all. And, and, but Jesus can set you free. Say free. free. He can set you free. And you young people, you ought to be very smart and leave it alone completely and absolutely. There's no good thing about it. Jesus can give you more high in two minutes than you'll ever get anywhere else. It'll make you, it'll set you free from another law. Now, maybe you didn't know it was there. A law of sin and death. Sin and death work on laws.
Transgression is the breaking of a law. Nobody can go to hell without transgression. The only way to go to hell is transgression. And, and so there's a law there that if you break this law, transgression, uh, then you have to be punished for it. Uh, there are laws in our universe uh, that you, you have to obey them. If you climb up on top of this building and say, you know, I'm a good American and, and I'm a great American and so forth, I don't have to obey the laws of gravitation. Well, just try it and see. You know, when you hit the ground, you'll find out you should have obeyed the laws of gravitation. There are laws set in this universe, and if you're stupid enough to break them, you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it with tears and sorrow and hell. It's so much better to live good and to live right and to live correct. It's the happiest way to live. After 76 years, I can tell you of a truth. I've never seen a person live for God that regretted it. And I have seen tens of thousands that wish to God they hadn't have played with sin. Can you say amen? All right. When you come into relationship with a beautiful law called spirit of life, in that law you receive power and authority in that you become, you become and have dominion over another law called the law of sin and death. That, when anybody says the devil made me do it or anybody says I couldn't help doing it, you're not telling the truth. You really want to do it. It's your problem. Because when you come into this new law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, then you have broken and destroyed the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death at that point has no jurisdiction over you. Can you say amen? That's point number one. Uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit is involved in setting us free from all sin. Number two, the Holy Spirit cancels the penalty of death. Now, when you sin, you're under a penalty. There's your law coming in, the law of sin and death, you see. So when you transgress and you deliberately tell God you're going to do as you please, you're going to break his commandments and so forth, remember, you come under this penalty. But in Romans 8 and 2, it says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from this law of death. And so he cancels the penalty. He cancels the penalty that you bring yourself under because of your transgression. And so the penalty is then gone. Now, and number three, he fulfills all righteousness. Now, now this one is great. You have to really let it sink into you. I hope you're not thinking about yesterday or tomorrow. Let your spirit reach deep down into what we're doing right here, right now. And the very next verse, which is verse 4, Romans 8 and 4. It says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? That the righteousness that belongs to the kingdom of God, that the righteousness there is, in Christ Jesus can be fulfilled in us. You know, it can be fulfilled in us. People can look at us and say, well, there it is right there. You know, there it is right there. We, we can identify the world by saying, look at me. I've gone through this law of sin and death. Its power has been broken and I'm living in a new law, the law of life in Christ Jesus. And so he says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, and they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. When you're walking in Christ Jesus, you don't have the problems that other people have. The Holy Spirit has broken that thing over you. You don't have to wring your hands and say, oh, I, I wish I could stop this. I wish I could stop that. No. The Lord Jesus told us specifically that adulteries and lying and murders come up out of the heart. They don't come from your head or your hands. In, in the Arab countries, if you steal something, they cut your right hand off. No, they should cut your heart out. Are you here? I mean, they're, they're missing the mark. It's not your hand that steals. It's your inside, your, your solical parts of you that do the stealing and, and not yourself. And so 
when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he fulfills the righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? The righteousness of God is when we receive and accept the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in his efficacious death for us on the cross. When you say, I received the blood of Jesus Christ for my salvation, not my good works, and, and uh, not the nice things that I do, not the nice things that I think about, but when it comes to my salvation, I receive the grace given unto me through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I am now saved, not by anything that I have ever done, I am not saved because Jesus died on Calvary, and because my sins were washed away by His blood, I have believed, and I have received, and I am saved. Hallelujah. And, and so if you will receive that, that is the righteousness. That's God's, God's righteousness is the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us from our sins. And Isaiah, it says, it says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So if you try to cook up uh, your own righteousness, uh, you, you won't ever get to heaven. Human righteousness will never save you. It's the righteousness of Jesus that we receive, and it is put on the inside of us. We're unworthy of it, but it is the gift of God unto us. And we, when we receive His righteousness, we're saved through the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Now, in that verse 5 again, He says, They that, you know, walk after the flesh. Uh, that don't really mean your skin here. It doesn't really mean your skin. Uh, what it means if you walk after carnality, but if you walk after the things of sin, if you're wanting to be out there in the sinning line with the sinning people, and you're lusting after their parties and their shows and all the stuff they have, that's what we call walking in the flesh uh, and in the natural, in your Adamic nature, uh, in your in your mind, your emotions, and your will, which is your heart. We find that that's where you will be walking. You will not be walking in God, the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost. You will not be walking in the Word of God that directs our feet and is a light unto our pathway. But the righteousness of the law, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the things of this world. We just don't go that direction. We walk after the Holy Ghost. We're here right now in this class by the moving of the Holy Spirit. We could have been somewhere else. We could have all been somewhere else. But something inside of us said, hey, let's go learn more about God. Let's go learn more about heaven. Let's go learn more about how easy it is to love Jesus and to serve Jesus. And that's what we're here for. And then he says, and we are they who refuse to walk after the flesh. And, and we refuse to mind the thing. That means give yourself over to it and endorse it and so forth. But we are those who walk after the spirit of the living God. What a beautiful way to live. What a beautiful way to live. Now you see, uh, he hasn't mentioned a denomination yet. I mean, it's still here. I know you're really sad that he hasn't said that your denomination is saved. You see, Hell will be full of denominations, you know. Everybody be quarreling which denomination is best down there, I imagine. But they're all in hell. You see, you're going to get to heaven because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't had that, you're not going to make it. And so it's better to go God's way and to believe the Word of God and to be sure of heaven. To be sure of heaven. Can you say amen? I used to write a little thing around uh, real, 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 real often in my Bible and notebooks and all. I write these little words, I'd say, it's better to be safe than sorry. You, you, you know, a young person has so many little things that can happen, you know, that he can do this and do that and do the other. And then, is it wrong? Is it not wrong? Is it good or is it bad? You don't have to do that when you follow that little maxim, you see. If you say, no, it's better to be safe than sorry. If it's going to rebound and, and steal your life and steal your spirit away from you, it, it's just better to be safe than sorry. Yeah, you're real vocal out there. I see that. Number four, he dwells or indwells all believers. There, there is no doubt about it at all. Uh, that is in verse nine. But ye are not in the world. That's another word for that word flesh there. Uh, you're just not in the flesh, he says. But you are in the spirit. Still with a capital S, speaking of the person of the Holy Spirit. You are in the spirit. 
why I keep saying that is we're not talking about your spirit within you. Your spirit within you is an experience. You're, you're, you're born again uh, through receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, and then your human spirit uh, connects itself with the divine spirit, and that we know that we're the sons of God. But we're here discussing the person of the Holy Ghost and His function and operations on the inside of us. And, and as I've said before, you cannot learn enough about it. No human that ever lived has ever known too much about the moving of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And if you're not interested in that, I can tell you one thing. You are dull spiritually, and you live in a desert spiritually, and you likely will get worse all the time and not better. Everybody hear that? Life is made up this way. You never remain in one spot very long. You're either going one way or the other. If you're not in this class to get more spiritual, for sure you're going to get duller against God. You're going to have other things you say, well, I just like those things better. And if you do that, you're going to miss the great prize of the universe. You're going to miss seeing Jesus in heaven. I want to see him, don't you? All right. But you're not in the flesh or in the world. You're in the spirit. If, put a little circle around that little word, if. It's just two letters, it just means everything. Isn't that something? If so be, that the Spirit of God, still with a capital, you see, not speaking of an experience, but the person of the Holy Ghost. If He, the Spirit of God, dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ. Now, the Holy Ghost is called the Spirit of Christ. That when He functions in this earth, it is Christ functioning. When he moves in your heart, it is Christ moving in your heart. He is a co-worker with the Lord Jesus Christ in your behalf. And, and so when he begins to function and to work inside of you, that is the Holy Ghost working in you in Christ Jesus. They, they are functioning there together. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you, that good spirit, kind spirit, Holy Spirit, love of the Word of God, love for prayer, love for the house of God, now, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, that's very simple, isn't it? If you don't have this Holy Spirit guiding your life, you don't have Christ at all. The Bible says you don't have Christ at all. You may have a religion. You may have a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. But you do not have the essence of Christ if this Holy Spirit that we're teaching about, if he doesn't have dominance, preeminence, and if you don't ask every day for his leading and his guiding, if you don't do that, then he has no part. Jesus Christ then has no part in your life. Jesus Christ can only have part in your life as the Holy Spirit brings you to him. It is the Spirit that brings us to Christ. When we say a person has conviction, it means the Holy Ghost went in there, made him unhappy. Not that he should come to the Holy Spirit, but that he should come to Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is working on behalf of Jesus in every person living on the face of this earth. And all the people said, all right. It says, if we have not the Spirit of Christ, we don't belong to him. Or we're not his uh, whatsoever. All right. Uh, in verse 10, the, the next verse, it says that he gives life. It says the Spirit is life because of righteousness. You know, every one of these verses just could be broken down into, you might say, many, many sermons or lessons or so forth. They are so important. They're so directive to our living. And people that don't read the Bible miss all of this. If your Bible is laying there with dust on it at home and you haven't turned to Romans 8, you just can't imagine what all you have missed. And God talking to you through him, uh, the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit is life. The Holy Ghost himself. He is life because of righteousness. What is righteousness again? It's, it's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansing us from our sins. The only righteousness in heaven is the blood of Jesus. There is no other righteousness in heaven but the blood of Jesus. And if you ever expect to get there, there's only one road. If you ever expect to get in, there's only one door. And the, Jesus himself said, if you try to get in any other way, at that point in time, you are a thief and a robber. And so we just don't want to get in, try to get in any other way. And all, this, and all the people said, Amen. Amen.